again tonight. We appreciate what the Lord did for us last night and how he helped us. And uh, I just felt great liberty last night preaching. And you wish it could be like that every time you stand. I always dread coming back on Tuesday night after it starts off real good on Monday night. You're supposed to laugh at that right there. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad you're here tonight. I appreciate the Lord. I trust you've thought much about prayer today and how what a great avenue that we have. And I like what the brother said. Prayer is not just a one-way conversation. We talk to him, but when he talks back is when business picks up. Now, I've... I'd be lying if I told you I was always happy about what he talked back to me about. But it's not always a happy time when God talks back to you because sometimes he's trying to get you in line with his will. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the Lord. It's good to see all of you. And thank you for being here. You could have been a lot of places tonight. But I appreciate you being here in the Lord's house. You pray for us these days. Uh, preacher, um, I do pastor in the Butler, Tennessee, uh, Dyson Grove Baptist Church. I've been 26 years there. And um, in dog years, I think that's a hundred and some years that I've been pastoring there. But anyway, uh, it feels like it sometimes. But anyway, I appreciate the Lord and the privilege he's given me to serve the people of Dyson Grove Baptist Church. We're just a country church. Uh, we enjoy worshiping. I, I like the fact that uh, some of you folks know what it is to rejoice and openly worship God. There are elements in the Baptist movements of our day that are trying to discourage that. Matter of fact, they'll even ridicule. Well, I'm going to tell you, I thank God that uh, I, I came up around some people that knew what it was to get in the spirit of worship. And uh, people say, well, they're in the flesh when they do that. Everything you do, you're in the flesh. But sometimes the spirit motivates. You see, this is the thing about it is, the Bible said they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now if you read your Bible, that word spirit there is not a capital S. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit there, he's talking about the human spirit. But you see, the human spirit, in order for worship to be right, it has to be brought in line with truth. And you see, your human spirit, every one of you has got a different personality. There are some of you that are outward and bubbly, and then there's some of you that are more introverted, and you're quiet. You see, I'm glad God didn't just make it so that people that was loud and boisterous could worship. But I'm glad he made it so that if you're quiet and introverted, you can worship as well when we fall in line with truth. Amen. And I'm glad, praise God, I, I like it when folks get to praising God. I encourage it at the church when that happens. We don't do as much of it as I wish we did. But every now and then, when God moves through and blesses, I'll find me a spot and help them out a little bit. Amen. 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 I appreciate that. Our forefathers, they paved the way. I've been in some meetings where it was such a move of God, you just you didn't even want to move. You just... God was doing such a real thing. Some of the most blessing, the biggest blessings of my life have been from little saints of God that I can picture them in my mind's eye right now just getting blessed and blessing others by getting blessed. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate the songs tonight. I enjoy good singing. I just enjoy singing, praise the Lord. Uh, you can even find something good and bad singing. <laughs> Amen. I love, I love somebody... And everybody we're living in a culture today, we're infatuated with talent. I'm, I'm all for talent. I wish I had more of it. And, uh, but I'm going to tell you something. Don't get hung up on whether somebody's got a lot of talent or not. It's not about the talent. It's about the touch. Probably, and I've heard, uh, I've heard uh, how great thou art sung many, many times down through the years in my life. I've heard George Beverly Shea sing that, and my, what a powerful voice he had, and, and how he could sing it. But the greatest version of that I ever heard 
was one night in revival meeting in a country church in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Wasn't but about 30 people there. And they got up and they said, well, for our special tonight, I said, Brother Jimmy's going to sing for us. I didn't know who Brother Jimmy was. And all of a sudden, that I, I looked and I noticed they were helping this man up to the piano. He was a handicapped man, and you could tell he was even mildly, maybe uh, mentally handicapped. And he was he physically, he couldn't walk by himself. His, his body's all twisted up. And they led him up, and he stood and held on to the piano to stand there. And uh, the lady sat down at the piano and began to play. And all of a sudden, Jimmy began to sing, How Great Thou Art. And when he sang, as far as being able to sing really good, he could not sing very good. But as I sat there and watched that man and listened to him sing, Oh Lord, my God. I sat there and wept like a baby. And I believe it's the greatest rendition of how great thou art that I've ever heard. And it wasn't because there was a lot of talent there, but it's because there was a lot of touch. Now, if you can get talent and touch both, you've you got a real winning proposition there. But I'm glad it's about God's anointing. I like what the preacher said, he anoints those that's anointable. Amen. Job chapter 2. Joe, I've done, done said too much tonight. Didn't mean to say all that. Usually I don't try to run rabbits unless they got big floppy ears. And then I'll, I'll chase them down if they're like that. Job chapter number 2. And I want to give you a simple thought tonight, and I won't be long before you. Everybody here that reads the Bible and you study the Bible, if you've heard anything from the Word of God, no doubt you've heard much preaching from the book of Job. This entire book is about a man's life, a man that we talk about him uh, uh, for many reasons, and you find in the first chapter the Bible describes the qualities that Job had. The Bible said, he was a perfect and an upright man, one that issued evil, one that he didn't put up with evil things. He ordered his family right. He made sacrifice for his children. He was uh, the wealthiest of the men of the East, the Bible said. Job had a picture-perfect life, if you're looking for that. But you find the reason we talk about Job and the reason there's 42 chapters concerning this man's life is not all about what all he had, but really it's about what he lost. It's about what trials came his way and what burdens that he carried. And many times, even in the 42 chapters, you find Job even questioning himself as to why God is this happening. Job has more questions than he does answers. His friends can't find the answer. They're all searching for an answer in the midst of his grief and trouble. And we find the scene in chapter 1, you find Job, Job suffers the loss of his servants, his children. And now we find in verse chapter number 2, the Bible says this, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So Satan went, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown and he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all and he sat down among the ashes then said his wife unto him dost thou still retain thine integrity curse god and die but he said unto her thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh what shall we receive good at the hand of god and shall we not receive evil 
in all this did not Job sin with his lips. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help us now tonight in this place. Lord, you know the hearts that are here. You know the burdens that may be in this building tonight. Lord, you know the battles that could be facing some life even uh, in this day. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us now tonight that we might look to you and Lord, understand where our help comes from. Lord, help us to understand where our comfort is found. And Father, I pray that you'd meet every need now that we have in this place. And God, we're gonna give you praise for all you do. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray and we ask it. Amen and amen. Here in chapter two, after Job has already suffered great loss that none of us would want to suffer in life, uh, it's one of the hardest things that you'll ever do is for a parent to have to bury a child. And Job has now suffered the loss of his children. He has suffered uh, much grief because of that. And now we find Satan coming again to the Lord and he's asking the Lord, says, you know what? He's, he said, uh, I know he's lost some things, but said, if you touch a man's flesh, said, he'll, he'll change then. And God said, go ahead. He said, you go ahead, do what you want to, but you got to preserve his life. I thought about that. Here God is. You think about Job and what a testimony this is to the man that he was that God offered him to Satan because God trusted him to do the right thing in the midst of adversity. I thought about that thought of when God trusts you with a trial. You see, all of us are gonna face some, but the fact of the matter is, I'm glad if we've got the faith we need that God can trust us with a trial in our life and we'll give God glory out of it. But here's the scene, the Bible said, that Satan smote Job with sore boils from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. Here Job is, he's now in not only in a state of mourning, but he's in a state of misery. He is now physically afflicted. He's trying to figure out, Lord, why is it happening like this? Messenger after messenger is coming with bad news. Have you ever had a season of your life where it seemed like it's one piece of bad news right after the other. Seemed like it didn't stop. It seemed like there was no break in it. And Job must have felt like that. He's, he's here in this scene and they're bringing the bad news. And now here he is. The Bible said that he is sitting and suffering with boils on his body. And the Bible said this up here. In verse number eight, the Bible says this, and he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. I began to study a little bit about that. One day I was looking at that, and if you're not real familiar with what a potsherd is, a potsherd is simply a broken piece of ceramic material. It is usually found in on archeological sites, it's a piece or a fragment of a broken pot. And here is Job at the lowest point of his misery. He's sitting among the ashes. He's out there and this signifies several things about Job. When you look at this pot shirt here, he is using, it is being used by Job to remove the body filth that is accumulated from the ulcers that's on his body. He's a man that don't have any comfort here. He has nobody to help him. He's a man that is bearing his grief what seems like alone. And he's here in the midst of the ash heap, if you will. And he's using this piece of pottery to simply scrape his body and to get an ease from his pain. Oh, I see, not only was it used for that, but this pot shirt is used to indicate the greatness of his calamity and sorrow. Here's a wealthy man sitting in the ashes now. Here's a man that's had everything. His life has been picture perfect. And now you look and he finds him in a spot that none of us would want to be in. We never know what life is going to bring our way. You may be on top of the world today, but by next week you may find yourself 
in the lowest place that you've ever been in life. But aren't you glad that when it seems like life is a roller coaster, aren't you glad there is a constant? And I'm glad his name is Jesus, praise God. He never changes and he never fails. I may be up today and may be down tomorrow, but the fact of the matter is I'm holding to an unchanging hand, hallelujah, to his name. Oh, when you think about this, this pop shirt is used to show that he has no help from anyone. He is separated in his sorrows. Even his own wife, she's not coming to him and saying, Job, can I put some ointment on your boils? Or Job, here's some clean cloths to put on. And, uh, no, she's not doing any of that herself. But before you get too hard on her, you have to understand she's facing the same grief that Job is. She's lost her children too. Her heart's broken too. And in her confusion, she does like many of us. She says something that really don't make a lot of sense. She said, why don't you go ahead and curse God and die? Well, Job said, you talk as one of the foolish women. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I'm glad in the midst of our sorrows, we can still find praise for the Savior. I began to think about that. I was at the house one day and I was studying this and I said, man, I sure wish I had a pot shirt. I was studying this story and I said, man, I wish I had a pot shirt that I could use to illustrate this message. And about the time I spoke that into my mind, all of a sudden the Holy Ghost told me, says, you do. And I thought, Lord, do I have a pot shirt? And then God brought something to my mind that I had in my study that I really had meant to throw away. But yet all of a sudden it had been sitting there for probably six months maybe. And all of a sudden I said, I do have a pot shirt. Matter of fact, I brought it with me tonight. I've got a bag here, and if I shake this bag, you can hear that there's something in here, and it's in pieces. And when I pull it out, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of it, but it's, a, it's the remnants of a pot that I bought one time. It was a nice pot. It was a brown, nice decorative vase, and uh, uh, there's a piece of it that's... Uh, Here's the bottom of it, and uh, here's the other side of it. And then I got a bunch of little pieces in here. Here's the top where, the, where you poured stuff in it. And uh, then I got a bunch of small fragments, and I've got a, I've got a bunch of little pieces, and I've got my pot shirt here. When I look at this pot, I have to tell you about this pot. The reason I bought this pot, I. There was a day I was, I was preaching a message over there uh, in, where Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 4, the man of God had died and the creditors were coming uh, to his widow demanding payment and were going to take her sons into servitude. And she went to the man of God and said, said the, the, the man of God's dead and the, the creditors have come. And Elisha said, what do you got in the house? She said, have nothing, save a pot of oil. And in that story, and the man of God said, I'll tell you what you do. You go to the neighbors and you borrow of them vessels. Borrow not a few. Said, borrow all the vessels you can borrow. And in that story, you know the story. If you've heard and you've read, they brought, her sons went and brought those vessels in. And she went in and shut the door like the man of God said. And she began to pour out of her one vessel into those empty vessels. And the Bible said she poured until all of those were filled. I'm talking about, you talk about a widow woman who struck oil in the back room. She did. And, uh, and, I, and uh, he said, now, he said, now take it and sell it and pay the creditor and live off of the rest. And the miracle of how God helped her. I preached a message, I initially bought this pot and I used it to preach a message titled, when God fills up a pot that you ain't God. <laughs> I'm glad God can fill up every pot I have 
and then he can fill up the ones I borrow. Amen. I'm glad he's a God that's able to fill up a pot that I ain't even got. And I preach that in revival. I carry that pot all over the country with me. Preaching in revival, talking about how God's able to supply your need. I was headed to a revival meeting somewhere and I, I thought in my mind, I said, I may preach that message. So I throwed it in the back of my truck with my suitcase and all kinds of stuff. And I was driving down road uh, and I come up on a traffic jam and had to hit my brakes. And all of a sudden I heard ka -chink. And I said, oh no, that didn't sound good. That sounded like my pot. Sure enough, when I got out and got to looking, I pulled it out and my pot had broken in half and into several pieces. And my first inclination was, well, it, I didn't pay a lot for it, but, but you know, I kind of liked that old pot. And I looked at it and I said, you know, I might could put that thing back together if I get me some glue, I believe I could. And so I went about the process of putting it back together. Actually was able to put it back together to the point you couldn't tell that it had been broken. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad that when God found me broken, he didn't throw me away. But I'm glad he loved me enough. He said, I believe I can put him back together. <laughs> Amen. And he put, I put that old pot back together. I continued preaching that message. And then one day, I was doing some studying about brokenness. And I was doing some studying. I came up on some information about, from Japanese culture. I don't know if you've ever heard of this or not, but in Japanese culture, there is an art form that they have in Japanese culture called kintsugi. Anybody here know anything about kintsugi? I saw you shaking your head, you do. Anybody else know anything about that? I didn't know a thing about this until I got to reading about this and I got to studying a little bit about this. And in this art form that they use in Japanese culture, kintsugi is a process that they use to put broken pottery back together again. And the reason it's an art form is that they put it together. They put it together with the seams and what they used to put it together with is gold. So that once it's put back together, that gleaming gold is showing through every crevice that it was broken in. And it's some of the most unique and beautiful artwork that you'll ever see in your life. And when they, you see that pot, and when I saw that, I said, that's what happened to my pot. It got broken and I, I knew where the cracks were and where it had been broken. I said, I'm gonna get me some gold paint and I'm gonna outline those. And when I did that, and I would take it places to preach, and I preached another message called, when God turns broken into beautiful. When God fills up a pot you ain't got, and when God turns broken into beautiful. Two messages out of the same pot. I was headed to a place last year to preach called Fletcher, North Carolina. And I had that pot in my truck, and I said, you know what? I, I might preach either one of those messages. And I was coming through Asheville, North Carolina, and I don't have to say anything more about that. All of a sudden I looked and it was, I had to make a decision, an executive decision. I, I said, I can either ram the rear end of that vehicle or I can lock this thing up with everything I've got. And I did just that. When I did that, suitcases went flying, my Bible went flying, everything, and all of a sudden I heard ka-chunk. And I said, oh no, that sounded like my pot. When I got to the motel down here, I, got, I pulled it out and it was broken. And it was broken badly this time. And I said, well, maybe with a little patience I can put it back together. And I actually took it in the motel while I was here in the meeting last year, several days and tried to work and I, finally I realized, I said, no, it's broken so badly this time that I can't fix it. And I just carried it back home with me and I, you do know there are some things in this life that will be broken so badly that they won't be fixed here, don't you? It'll take heaven to fix them. Now God will give comfort, but there are some things that won't be fixed here. We'll have to live with them. God will give us grace to live with them. There'll be some thorns that 
we'll beg God to take them away, but Paul will tell you, said, God didn't take mine away. He said, but he did say, my grace is sufficient. Amen. Yeah. So I carried that back to the house and I sat it down in my study. I meant to throw it away. But here it was sitting there and all of a sudden I'm reading about a man is as low as he can get and all of a sudden he's got a piece of broken pottery and he's scraping himself and in the midst of his low spot, in the midst of the, the, the hardest days of his life, when even his wife is no comfort to him, I find a man finding comfort in the midst of brokenness. Matter of fact, he has been comforted by something that's already been broken itself. Amen. I got news for you right now, every one of us, we're going to have some time, we're going to find ourselves in a broken state. There's going to be days when your heart's going to be broken. There's going to be days your mind's going to feel like it's broken. There's going to be days that your flesh may feel broken. But I'm glad in the midst of those days of our life, I'm glad there's a God that's a God of all comfort, amen. And I'm glad we can still find comfort in the midst of brokenness. I begin to think about that. I, I Really, this message tonight is not so much about Job but it's about this potsherd. You see, this potsherd represents three things tonight in this story. Number one, it represents the challenging process of life. This pot has a story to tell. Uh, there was a day when it was a pretty nice pot, shiny. Man, you talk about it was being shown off everywhere. Had a testimony, here's a pot, God can fill your pot up. But then there was a day when a break took place in its life. Man, it was left in pieces, but it had somebody who owned it that cared enough to put it back together. Amen. Yeah, I said, you know, I think a lot of that old pot. I believe I'll just try to put it back together. And I did put it back together. As a matter of fact, it was more beautiful than it was in its original form. All because of that gleaming gold that you could see. Oh, sometimes we try to hide where we've been broken. We try to hide those areas of our life where there's been some breakage. But God gets more glory when others can see. I got news for you. We're all a bunch of cracked pots. Every one of us. Amen. Some of us just more broken than others. But boy, I tell you, when you get when God gets glory is when we show somebody else, yes, I've been broken, but look how he put me back together. Look what he's done in my life. Look how he's helped me. Hallelujah to his name. But this potsherd represents the challenging processes of life. You do know that life will knock some dents in you. You start out, you start out, and everything's wonderful. You start down the journey of life, and the next thing you know, some unexpected thing comes your way. Some tragedy, I've, I've dealt as a pastor preacher, I have walked into some, some of the most tragic situations of life that anyone could ever walk into. There's a lot of times people say, well, them preachers, they pay them too much. Well, I don't know what you pay your pastor. Probably you do the best you can and you probably still can't pay him what he's worth. But I'll say this, there ain't no amount of money to pay a man. I'll never forget, I had a little family in my church. Matter of fact, one of my deacons, he was about 51 years old. His little mama was a prayer warrior in our church. She was one of them little shouting granny women. I'm talking about Miss Ida was my prayer warrior. She knew how to get a hold of God. Her son was a deacon, Jim was his name. And uh, Jim was, he had, he had an abscessed tooth and he was going to have to have some dental surgery. And, and, uh, but he had had some stents put in his heart and he was on blood thinners and they, they said, we're going to have to take you off them blood thinners because if we do that surgery, the bleeding, we can't get the bleeding stopped. So they had taken him off of his blood thinners for a week and uh, he was at church on that Sunday and, and I could tell he didn't feel good but I just uh, I talked to him a little bit. I said, I hope everything goes well with your surgery this week. And he said, I'm hoping they can get it, get it out of there. And anyway, that night we stood and talked for about an hour at church after the service was over. 
went home and of course went to bed, went to sleep. And at about 6.30 on Monday morning, my telephone rang. And when it rang, it was Jim's mother, this my little prayer warrior. They're both in heaven now. But anyway, she said, Preacher, I hate to bother you so early. I said, would you pray? She said, Jim's not feeling, he's not doing well. She said, they're taking him to the hospital. I said, I will, Miss Ida. I said, uh, you let me know if you hear anything. And I said, I'll get, so I, I, I was waiting by the phone. Matter of fact, I was getting ready to head to the hospital or whatever I needed to do. And about 30 minutes later, the phone rang again. And when it did, I picked it up and it was somebody hysterically weeping on the other end of the line. Seven o'clock in the morning, hysterically. And I finally got him calmed down enough and it was this deacon's son. And this is the words I heard, said, Preacher, you gotta come. My dad's dead. My dad's dead. My dad's dead. And I don't know about you, but there ain't enough money to pay a man to have to walk into a situation on a Monday morning at seven o'clock with a family so devastated because he had died in his sleep. No doubt he'd had a heart attack. And all he was gonna have was a surgery to get a tooth out. But you don't understand these things that happen in life. And we got down there and his widow was so overcome with grief. I mean, a family just hysterical. And I did my best to comfort them. And finally, the, 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 his brother was there and he said, Preacher, would you go with me to tell mom? That's Miss Ida, my little prayer warrior lady. She didn't know he had died. They just told her that they would taken him to the hospital. I said, I will. We loaded up, we went over there and we walked in that little house and I could hear her sitting in there on the couch a praying and when we, me and her other son walked through the door, we didn't have to say anything. She looked at us and she said, he's gone, he's gone. And she began to cry like only a mother can that's lost a child. And she began to cry, she said, oh God, God why? Why, God, have you let me down? Why have you let me down? That's what she said. I did my best to comfort her that day. I said, we don't understand, but God hasn't let us down. She wept and she cried. We went through the burial and all that. It was a couple of weeks after that. She, she just was a shell of herself. She came to church one Sunday morning and I was standing out in the parking lot and she met me, she, I said, how you doing, Miss Ida? She said, I'm doing okay, I guess. She said, preacher, could I ask you something? I said, you sure can. She said, is there any way I could testify today? I said, Miss Ida, you know you can testify anytime you want to. I said, anytime you want to, you can testify. She said, well, preacher, I need to apologize to you and I need to apologize to the church. I said, what do you need to apologize to me and the church for? I said, you ain't done nothing to us, Miss Ida. She said, oh yes. She said, the day when you came and told me that Jim was dead, she said, I cried out in my grief that God had let me down. But she said, preacher, he ain't ever let me down. That was my weakness talking. And she said, he's never let me down. I just didn't understand. She said, but now God's given me a grace that I didn't know that I could experience. I got news for you right now. I don't care how low you may be, what your problem is, what battle you're facing, what giant's in front of you. I'm glad there's a God that can give comfort in the midst of brokenness, amen. The news may be coming bad here. The doctor's report may be coming bad there. There may be a bad situation with a young and out there in the world and your heart may be broken and your tears fill with eyes, but here you are just like Job and in the midst of your sorrow, and your suffering. In the midst of it, there's a broken peace that's bringing comfort to your life. Hallelujah to his name. Amen. Amen. Represents the challenging process of life. This represents number two, the changing purposes in life. This pot started out as a nice decorative vase to be set up in a living room somewhere and everybody would look at it and say, what? It's your nice vase you got there. Now all of a sudden, after it's had a break, breaking point in its life, ain't nobody wanting to talk about how pretty it is anymore. Matter of fact, they've been talking about how it can be filled up, and now you ain't no way you can fill it up. It's broken too many pieces. 
But sometimes we get to thinking that our purpose is through when we've been broken in life. When really God changes purposes in our life. Do you realize this pot now? I could have thrown it away the first break. But I didn't. I put it back together. I could have thrown it away after the second break. But I didn't. I said, I can't put it back together, but I believe it's still worth keeping. Amen. Amen. Now, who in the world would keep a broke pot that's broke in pieces and carry it around with them except me? God would. Some of you have been broken so many pieces. It's like God just picks you up in his bag. He carries you with him. And you say, but everybody else would have thrown me away. That's why I'm glad I'm serving Jesus. Amen. He's attracted to brokenness. Amen. Oh, I'm glad, praise God, no matter how broken you are, how low down you may feel, I'm glad that he's a God that will come down to where you are. And I'm glad in the midst of it. You say, but I, I want to be the shiny pot. I want to be the pot everybody brags on. But God said, but oh, I've got another purpose for you. There's going to be a lot of people sitting in them pews. They're not shiny pots either. They've had some rough knocks in life. They've had the edges knocked off of them. They've had some hard falls in life. And I want to show them that there's still a way that they can keep going for the Glory of Almighty God. Amen. That pot shirt, you can still see the little bit of that gleaming gold on that where I put it together. <laughs> now it's, uh, it's not whole as it was at one time. It's been splintered. There ain't as much left of it. You ever feel like that on the journey of life? that the journey's taken something out of you? Every one of us. I wish I could tell you that we all finished the race and we all feel just like we did when we was 13, 14 years old. But the journey takes a toll. The journey takes a toll. But I, I'm glad that even, I'm going to preach this Sunday. I've got there's an old preacher friend of mine He's been pastoring over 30 years in the church he's in. His health is failing now to the point that he's having to step aside from the pulpit. One of the most precious preachers you'd ever want to be around. And his son-in-law called me and said, Preacher, I know you don't usually leave your church on Sunday. He said, but we was just wondering. Said, this is going to be this is going to be his last pastor appreciation Sunday. And the church wanted to know, would you come and preach it? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of messages in my repertoire to preach to an old man of God that's now in failing health and he's having to give up the very thing that he's lived for most of his life now. I don't have too many messages that will really encourage him. Then again, I got to thinking, maybe I do. Because them changing purposes in life. He's no longer going to be able to do what he's been doing for the last 30 some years in that place. But that don't mean God's done with him. That don't mean God's done with him. I think I, I feel like probably in the ministry as men, and I'm, of course I'm, I'm no spring chicken myself, but I see some of these older men, and when they get to the point they can't do what they one time did, the devil tells them, says, you're done, and there's nothing left for you to do. And the devil is a liar. Amen. Because some of the greatest things that can take place in that man of God's life is when the devil has told him it's over, and God says, oh no. I'm just changing his purpose now. There's some young preachers out there that needs to glean wisdom from a man like this. There's some people out there that's going to need his praying more than they've ever needed it. Can I say to you the challenging process of life we're reminded in this posture. The changing purpose of life we're reminded. 
But here's what the one I really like, the continuing persistence in life. Out of the story of Job, and we find a lot of details about what happened to him, but at his lowest point, sitting in the ashes, the only thing that's mentioned being there with him is a potsherd. In other words, that potsherd was there when everybody else had left him to fend for his sin. Matter of fact, that's why I didn't throw this pot away. It's here tonight. It goes with me to church now on a regular basis. Can I say this to you? Somebody says, well, I'm in such a mess. Why do I need to go to church? That's why you need to go to church. I see people today walk through our doors at the church with broken lives like I never dreamed I'd see. Just about three weeks ago, we've got a man in our church. He's actually a preacher in our church. He's in his probably middle 40s, maybe getting close to 50. And he'd been praying for his brother. His brother's lost, having a lot of problems in life. And we were headed to the prayer altar got an out, outdoor rock altar we pray at on Sunday and we were headed to the prayer altar in between the 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock service to pray and one of our men slipped up to him and said preacher pray he said brother Leon told me that his brother called him this morning wanted him to come pick him up he wanted to come to church so we prayed we got in there at 11 o'clock and I looked back and there sat the old boy sat there long hair the marks of the world all over him Never been there before in his life, building almost full of people. And he sat back there. And the choir began to sing, and his brother sitting right beside him, Brother Leon. And while the choir began to sing, we got to sing in a song. I don't know if you heard it. The old pastor quartet uh, sang this song called Broken People Like Me. And I, I fell in love with that song first time I ever heard it. The chorus goes something like this. It says, to the nobodies and the could have beens the disillusion and the doubters, to the lives train wrecked by sin, to the down and outers. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it says, all the mixed up, messed up, broken people like me. As we sang that song, his brother leaned over, just put his arm around his brother, just sitting there with his arm around his brother. And all of a sudden, I looked at Brother Leon, the saved brother, he got up and he just come to the altar and began to weep. Began to weep. And I watched his brother sit back there, just sit back there, looking, sit back there. But Leon's praying. That's another good reason to pray. He's a praying. A few more people's praying. All of a sudden, I looked and that big old boy got up and son, he come walking down that aisle in front of God and everybody. Fell on that altar right beside of his brother. His brother didn't even know who it was beside him. He looked up and seen his brother there. He grabbed his Bible, turned it open, and began to show him how to be saved out of the Word of God. That big old boy got saved that day, and I believe he hugged everybody in the church that day. Had never met, had never met none of us, and he hugged everybody in the church that day. You know what? He came in, he was broken. He came in and he said, I there ain't much left to me. The devil just about took it all. I'm glad, praise God, said, come on in. Come on in. There's room for more broken people at the house of God. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad there's a God. Give us comfort in the midst of brokenness. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us tonight. We thank you for how you've helped us. Lord, I pray that there's maybe people here tonight Lord, they're in situations of life that have brought them low. Lord, they're in situations of life that they didn't expect. Lord, they've gotten news that nobody wanted to hear. Lord, they've been so low by the journey of life. But God, I pray that tonight you'd help us just like Job. God, that we'd recognize the fact that you are a God of comfort in the midst of our times of brokenness. 
And God, I pray there may be somebody here that somebody they love is in a broken state right now. And God, maybe that we just need to pray for them tonight. God, I pray for whatever burden that someone has. Lord, there may be somebody here. There's been bad news from the doctor. Lord, there may be somebody here suffering from the brokenness of a broken home. Lord, whatever the brokenness is tonight, God, would you let them know they can find comfort in the midst of brokenness. Father, we'll thank you for what you do. Let's stand tonight as our dear sister comes to get a song to play. I want to ask you, how many of you would meet me in this hall and say, Preacher, I've got some, somebody that I need to pray for. It may be you. You say, Preacher, you, only God knows how broken my heart's been. Only God knows the situation that I've tried to fix and I can't fix it. Oh, only God knows what I've been carrying and what I've been going through. Only God knows. You may, may just want to come and find your place here in this altar tonight and let God help you tonight. I wonder, anybody else? God speaking to your heart? Why don't you come on as she gets ready to play? God speaking to your heart, why don't you come tonight? You say, but preacher, I've been broke so many pieces and the situation I'm facing can't be put back together. I know that. But God's grace is sufficient. And I'm glad His comfort is there in the midst of all of our struggles. I wonder how many more you say, Preacher, I, I need to come. You may be here tonight and you're like the old boy. You just need to be put back together by God. You may just need to come and say, God, here I am. I'm a mess. But if you'll have me, I'd like to have you. It may be that you need that tonight. And then there may be somebody here say, Preacher, I don't really even know what I do need. Well, God does. If you'll give him your heart tonight, he'll help you. I wonder anybody else tonight, you feel that need of prayer? Is there somebody you say, Preacher, I haven't come to the altar, but I do need prayer. Would you pray for me? Would you lift a hand, take it right back down tonight, let us pray for you tonight? Anybody like that in the building? Anybody say, Preacher, I've got a burdened heart, and I need somebody to pray for me. Would you pr lift your hand tonight? Anywhere I see that. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Father, we thank you tonight for what you've done for us. We thank you for how you've helped us. Lord, I'm glad that even in the midst of the brokenness of our life, Lord, the challenging processes of life, Lord, when it seems like the purposes have been changed of our life, God, we're not on the path that we started out on. You've diverted us into territories that we would never have gone by ourself. But God, I'm glad that you're faithful through every step of the journey. And Lord, even when we feel like we're in a heap and there's no help for us, God, I'm glad that you are a God that's able to give comfort to us as your children. And Lord, I pray, would you help us now? Lord, would you touch us by your good power? Father, meet every need, Lord, that in this altar. Lord, no doubt there are heavy burdened people here. There are people that are facing difficulties, Lord, too great for them to bear. God, I pray in the midst of it, would you let them feel your comfort. Lord, may they feel your blessing. Father, we're going to thank you for what you've done. Help us now, Lord, we pray. Oh, help us now, Father. Yes, God, how we need you tonight. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, God. 